Hi everyone and welcome back to Aronowitz Land. Hope you're having a great day. Everything's wonderful here in Aronowitz Land. I wanted to do a quick video about a TikTok reaction Instagram I just posted. This was a woman who had a uh, sty on her upper eyelid. So uh, she squeezed the sty and it was very... Um, watchable, I guess, uh, to watch her express this style. And I made the, I made a uh, reaction video to warn people that really squeezing that kind of thing, especially on your eyelid is, uh, on the dangerous side. So I wanted to expand upon that just a little bit more, explain a little bit about, uh, lumps on the eyelid. They're fairly common and infections in general in the soft tissues, <clears throat> because those are fairly common as well. So, Let's begin with the uh, woman who did the uh, self-doctoring. So we'll show a little uh, clip of it here. And as you can see, she has a little lump right here on her eyelid. It's just above the margin of the eyelid. <clears throat> and these um, lumps typically occur because the glands that are along the margin of our upper and our lower eyelid, they produce an oily secretion uh, similar to the sebaceous glands in our skin that produce oil in our skin. There are two kinds of glands in the skin, basically oily glands and uh, eccrine or sweaty glands. So the sweaty glands produce sweat, they, and this is a watery secretion. And then the other kind of secretion is oily secretion. So obviously we have a lot of secretions from our body and a lot of different kinds of glands, but on the skin, they're basically those two kinds. These glands along the eyelid were described in uh, the late 1600s by a German scholar named Meibomian, or My Meibom, and so they're called Meibomian glands in his honor, which is a whole other subject. I'm not a big fan of eponyms, but Meibomian glands is uh, something that you're going to see, so you may as well know the name of it. When they get stopped up, they cause what's called a chalazian or chalazian. So a chalazian is just a stopped up gland along the eyelid, either the upper or lower lid. Uh, they usually uh, occur in adults, not children, because uh, adults have a little more, a um, little thicker secretion. When they get stopped up, uh, they're usually painless and they usually are two or three millimeters above the actual margin of the lid, and they can get quite large. When you feel one, the answer is not to squeeze it. Don't squeeze it. <laughs> uh, what you want to do, usually there are good home remedies and you can look them up. Uh, you can use uh, boric acid soaks or warm compress or things like that to reduce the inflammation so that, uh, because when it gets swollen up, the uh, tube or the little orifice that the material or the glandular secretion comes out of the little duct gets gets stopped up and uh, if you squeeze it cause more swelling that'll just make it harder so you want to soften it by warming it up a little bit reducing inflammation usually they'll clear on their own but the last thing you want to do is squeeze it um, and a chalazian is painless because it's generally not too inflamed on its own and it generally is not infected. Once it gets infected, um, it basically uh, turns into a sty or a hordolium, but sty is the common term for it. And then now it's red, it's very inflamed, it's even painful. And sometimes it'll drain itself, like in this woman's case, you could see that there was already an opening in the skin if you look carefully at that video. And she squeezes that. So um, this is a particularly dangerous thing to do in the face because you've got to remember sort of the physics of it. If you have a, if you have a sack and you're squeezing something out of the sack, even though there's a hole in that sack in that that cheesy thick material is coming out, you're creating pressure inside that sac. And the same pressure that's forcing that material out through the opening is also present throughout the rest of that sac and pushing on that sac. So if that sac gives way somewhere else, 
what you're going to do is you're going to extrude or force that material out in a direction you didn't count on, which is inside. And that can obviously be disastrous because you have this irritating material that's already colonized with bacteria. And now you've contaminated all this surrounding tissue that's already inflamed and swollen and tender and is already having trouble healing itself. And now you've just created another big disaster. So that infection can then spread and can be real mess. You don't want to squeeze these things uh, because you're, even though it's gratifying to relieve the pressure, you're really, you're really risking creating a bigger problem. So um, that's the difference between a Chalazian and a Stye or Hordolium. These are both arising out of a clogged uh, duct uh, from the meibomian glands, which are sebaceous glands along the margin of the eyelid. So that brings up then the topic of uh, soft tissue infections in general. So that's sort of the big topic, but I think that it's easiest to approach it by just simplifying it down to some basics. We're not going to deal with the oddball soft tissue infections, but rather the more common ones that occur in a healthy population. And most of us at some point in our lives will have a, some type of, of soft tissue infection. And so it's, it's good to know uh, some of the basics. So here's the basics. Most of these soft tissue infections are caused by a bacterial infection. And this is discovered a couple of hundred years ago uh, by the first people who started seeing bacteria with the aid of microscopes. Uh, the first person obviously was, well, Galileo did a little bit, but Lowenhoek, uh, the Dutchman, where is really credited with the first uh, workable microscope. He saw all of these little miniature animals, including bacteria, and then the next generation put that together with the uh, observation that we saw these creatures in wounds that were obviously infected, and that led to the uh, what's called the germ theory, that bacteria cause many infections. And if you can identify that bacteria, that, that infectious living agent that's causing the infection and uh, somehow kill it with the patient's own immune system or the aid of antibacterial agents, then you can, you can treat uh, the soft tissue infections and other infections. And the age of germ theory, and then later with the development of antibiotics, which came about at the very end of World War II in the 40s with the advent of penicillin. And you should remember the name Ian uh, Fleming, the scientist who discovered the first really usable antibiotic. There were others before, but the first antibiotic of the modern era. So that led to the uh, ability for the medical profession to deal with infections for the first time and, uh, and infectious diseases went way down as a very, very common uh, cause of premature death to something that's generally treatable nowadays. So sorry for that aside, but uh, good to kind of put it in context. Now, with soft tissues, there are basically two patterns of soft tissue infections that are caused by bacteria. One is a little volcano that fills with white creamy fluid and that eventually explodes or is lance, and that's an abscess, of course. And that's caused by staph species, typically. And the white creamy material is white blood cells mixed with some blood, mixed with some fluid, and mixed with bacteria. And if you take that creamy fluid, you look at it under the microscope, you'll see loads of white blood cells. It's white because there's a lot of DNA in white blood cells and because they're dividing rapidly. They've got a lot of DNA as a consequence and that's what gives that grayish white uh, uh, color to pus. So every fluid that comes out of a wound isn't pus. 
and the yellow uh, watery fluid that comes that weeps from a wound is is um, typically not pus but rather um, plasma and uh, it congeals into a scab and uh, that's a whole different process that has nothing to do with the bacteria typically. It has to do with the fact that capillaries weep fluid and the blood without the blood cells is that yellowish fluid. It's yellowish because of the proteins in the, uh, in the rest of the blood and it congeals <clears throat> or dries out, desiccates, and forms that scab. But that's a whole different thing than pus. Pus is that white creamy fluid that comes out and it's typically filled with bacteria as well, although sometimes we can have what's called a sterile abscess. So if you've ever seen a suture uh, close to the skin that spits out, that it starts poking out of the skin, forms like a little tiny uh, mini abscess, and then it drains itself, that's usually a sterile abscess, meaning you have all the white blood cells and you have that creamy fluid, but it's not really infected. There's no bacteria in it. So abscesses are one form of soft tissue infection, usually associated with staph. The other is um, cellulitis. And cellulitis, also there's erysipelas, which is another kind of spreading soft tissue infection or flesh-eating bacteria. You've heard of that necrotizing fasciitis that spreads as a red wave, if you will. Uh, across the skin very rapidly, almost some, sometimes so fast you can watch it. Um, those soft tissue infections are characterized, are called cellulitis, and they are characterized typically uh, by an infection with strep, although mixed flora, or we refer to bacteria as flora. Mixed flora, there are a lot of different bacteria sometimes, but if you just remember that abscesses are caused by staph usually, and uh, cellulitis uh, is caused by strep. That'll give you a good starting point. And then you'll see the cellulitis is characterized by redness, a little bit of swelling and redness, and then you can have an ascending lymphangitis where that redness is spreading along the uh, lymphatics. So you'll see little streaks like a map going up and once you see those streaks coming out of that red area, that's a very dangerous sign because that infection is spreading now uh, and has a risk of spreading into the bloodstream and causing bacteria in the bloodstream, also known as bacteremia. And that's a big problem because the bacteria then can seed different parts of the body, especially if you have a breast implant or or a heart valve implant, any kind of foreign body where that bacteria can find a place to set up shop, um, becomes a big, uh, it becomes a big risk when the bacteria is in the bloodstream. And then of course, the next step with bacteria in the bloodstream is a whole systemic or body-wide, system-wide reaction to this foreign invasion called sepsis. And sepsis is a a uh, highly dangerous state uh, where multiple organs become affected and the patient's vital signs become affected, blood pressure, pulse, and all that, and it can, it can be fatal. Uh, so that's the next step after a cellulitis begins to spread. Um, so those are, the, those are the two forms of uh, soft tissue infections, generally speaking, caused by bacteria. Let's talk about a, a basic thing then that we should know when we're looking at the uh, something that may be infected, and that is what? Are, how do we identify something that's infected? Do we have to take a culture? Do we have to have a microscope? Well, no. Most of these things clinically are pretty obvious, at least. Um, at least for, uh, for the majority of cases, uh, the clinical examination should give us some, some clue that there's a infection going on. So what are the, 
what are the four cardinal signs, the four big signs of uh, a soft tissue infection. So let's count them down. One is going to be redness, erythema. So redness obviously is associated with infection. Two is edema or swelling. So swelling, the tissue gets puffy and red. Three is when you feel that tissue and usually feel with the back of your hand like this, you're more sensitive on the back of your hand for heat. That's why your, your mother would put her the back of her hand to your forehead to see if you had a fever. Heat is uh, the number three. And so we have redness, we have swelling, we have heat, and we have pain. So those four things, uh, redness, swelling, heat, pain. Those are the signs of inflammation, but they're the signs of infection also. And it can be difficult sometimes to tell the difference between simple inflammation caused by something other than a bacterial infection and a bacterial infection such as an abscess or cellulitis based on that, those, the presence or absence of those cardinal signs. And of course, somebody who has a very suppressed immune system will not necessarily show those signs or won't show them in um, as obviously as somebody who has a very uh, healthy functioning immune system. Um, those are the local signs. So the systemic signs don't occur until later. So the fact that the person does not have a fever, does not, is not uh, have an elevated pulse, is not showing systemic or system-wide signs, doesn't mean that they don't have a local infection. So just good to know. The other point I wanted to expand on is um, uh, self-doctoring. So with a lump, it's always fun to squeeze it. And there's a whole industry associated with um, with uh, watching people squeeze lumps. And there's whole professions, I think, that are populated by people that love squeezing lumps. Um, that's all well and good. And that is a, a very acceptable mode of treatment for a lot of these things, but uh, there are some big dangers. So it's good to understand that when you squeeze on uh, something, you can, you're can you squeezing in all directions when you're squeezing on a sphere or a something that's a, you know, a, a ball basically. And when you're providing external pressure, that that pressure is being applied internally to the walls almost equally probably. So you can cause a rupture of that cyst or mass or whatever it is, uh, abscess, and force that material into places you don't expect or you, you don't want that to happen. And when that happens in this central part of the face, it can be particularly dangerous. In some of their, some other areas of the body, so it, the body can be particularly dangerous. So if you're going to self-doctor, and I'm a big fan of being in charge of your own health care, I would, my advice would be to be informed and to educate yourself before you embark on that. You, um, if you, if you wouldn't wish that kind of care for uh, your child or your loved one or your best friend, why would you, uh, give that kind of care to yourself. So a lot of self-doctoring ends up in problems and um, unnecessary trip to the emergency room and even uh, stays in the hospital and surgery and that sort of thing. So better to be uh, prudent, inform yourself before you embark on that. So I hope you enjoyed this little diatribe on self-doctoring, soft tissue infections, and um, uh, eyelid cysts. And uh, if you have any comments, any suggestions, something I left out or I got wrong, please leave it in the comments below. If you have any ideas for other topics you'd like to see me address, uh, please leave it in the comments below. And until then, uh, I will get back to work and I uh, wish you a great day.